Okay, Mark. <clears throat> Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so good evening and welcome to the second installment of the ASMI Masterclass Series. My name is Dr. Mark Rothermick and I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Andrew Sports Medicine here in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm pleased to be moderating tonight's roundtable. Uh, we had a great response to our first webinar as part of the ASMI Masterclass Series earlier this summer. And we're excited to have such an excellent panel discussing tonight's topic, which is cutting edge medicine and science in UCL injuries. While we're waiting for just another minute or two for participants to join, I just wanted to run through a few housekeeping items before we get started. We will address questions during the panel discussion at the end of presentations. Please submit questions for the panel using the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. For those watching on YouTube and Facebook, please send an email to ASMI's course coordinator Caroline May at carolinem at asmi.org with your name and credentials, MD, ATC, PT, et cetera, to receive your certificate for tonight's session. CME and CEU certificates will be emailed in approximately two weeks. Participants other than MDs and ATCs will receive a certificate of attendance that can be presented to your professions board to receive credit. Please be sure to click on the link to SurveyMonkey that was in your reminder email earlier this afternoon. We appreciate your feedback about tonight's session as well as any suggestions you might have to make a, help make us make uh, future masterclass sessions better. And again, I would encourage our participants tonight to submit questions using the chat feature at the bottom of Zoom, not the Q&A, the chat. I'll be monitoring the questions as they come in. We'll try to get to all of them if we can in the time allotted for this session. Each member of tonight's panel has had a significant portion of their clinical practice and their research focus on elbow injuries in young athletes. From established issues such as UCL injuries in professional baseball to areas of recent research such as injuries at the collegiate level and in youth baseball, each member of tonight's team will offer insight into this epidemic. We recently described the incidence of UCL injuries in Division I college baseball, which was previously unknown, Amazingly, we got almost every D1 school to complete a survey over the past three years to give us a lot of data regarding this subject. We found that the incidence of UCL surgery in college baseball players was overwhelmingly high, with 223 surgeries occurring in Division I baseball alone just last year. Stunning numbers demonstrating that this is a problem that not only affects professional players, but our most young and vulnerable athletes as well. Dr. Jim Andrews has been at the forefront of a recent push to prevent injuries in youth baseball, and he may speak a little about that tonight. So I think now we're ready to turn things over to Dr. Andrews for an introduction. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, and uh, I'd certainly like to welcome everybody to the second ASMI Masterclass webinar. Tonight's topic is uh, truly uh, uh, one that's on the burner right now trying to figure out what to do to prevent these injuries that we're seeing that continue to escalate relative to the Tommy John's ligament injury in the throwing elbow. Uh, it's particularly important to discuss this from a preventative standpoint because as we've said before, we've had a tenfold increase in, in young throwers with Tommy John's injury since year 2000. We'll discuss that a little bit more, but first I'd like to introduce the all-star panel that we've assembled to bring you up to date on what's been a significant problem and doesn't seem to be going away. It actually seems to be escalating. We've been dealing with this from a preventative standpoint, primarily through the STOP program, uh, which was initiated in the year 2000 by the American Orthopedic Society of Sports Medicine, uh, which dealt with prevention at the grassroots level. To get us started, Dr. Jeff Dugas from the Andrews Sports Medicine Orthopedic Center is going to talk about the why and how of UCL reconstruction and repair. Next, Kevin Wilk, who all of you know from Champion Sports Medicine is going to take you through UCL rehabilitation and talk about the differences in his treatment protocols between patients who have undergone a ligament reconstruction and those who have had a repair type procedure. One of Kevin's protégés, Mike Reinhold from Champions Physical Therapy and Performance in Boston will then present the updated interval throwing program that he's been working on for athletes trying to return to the sport from UCL injuries. 
And last but certainly not least, ASMI's Director of Research, Dr. Glenn Fleissing, will discuss whether an athlete's pitching mechanics are different after UCLA surgery. At the conclusion of Glenn's talk, as Mark pointed out, we'll have a panel discussion led by Mark. You're welcome to submit questions from the Zoom chat feature. And we try to get to as many of your questions as possible. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark to get things started. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. And our first speaker tonight is from right here at Andrews Sports Medicine in Birmingham, Alabama. This is Dr. Jeffrey Dugas talking about the why and how of UCL reconstruction and repair. All right, so um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to share screen here. There we go. So um, my charge was to um, have everybody uh, to put up uh, some information about uh, UCL repair and uh, reconstruction. I, I do have to disclose that I am a consultant for Arthrex and I receive a royalty on a kit that was created to support the repair technique and ASMI receives research and education support from, from all kinds of people and we appreciate that. It's what helps us to be able to continue to do the kind of research that uh, promotes these type, of, uh, these type of webinars. So it's important to know that operative management is only considered after a conservative failure. Um, there are a couple of times where we will operate acutely. You know, if there's something completely ruptured where we know it's going to be pointless in a thrower to, to manage these things non-surgically, this is a little more common in gymnasts than in throwers. We don't often see these big blown out ligaments in throwers. We see them occasionally. And also you got to know what the goal of the patient is. So we don't want to treat the MRI. We want to treat the patient. If the patient has a need to throw or they have a need for that ligament, then that's reasonable to fix it if it fails conservative management. But Somebody who doesn't want to throw or have to throw doesn't necessarily need their ligament fix. So this is not one of those things when you see it, you got to fix it. It's, it's definitely a subclass of individuals that, that need it done. Dr. Job, who, who is certainly one of the legends in, in this business um, and uh, was the first to do this in 1978 on Tommy John, obviously where the procedure got its name from. Interestingly, Tommy John had an ulnar nerve palsy and he swore he would never do it again, thought it was an abject failure and um, Tommy John eventually went back to pitching after another uh, surgery, but it wasn't until five years later that Dr. Job did the next one um, and he agreed to do the next one. So this, this procedure, which now has such a robust history, had a very inauspicious beginning. <clears throat> In the original report by Dr. Job, written by, uh, first authored by John Conway, one of his fellows at the time, he did a submuscular transposition of the nerve. Dr. Andrews modified this to be a subcutaneous transposition of the nerve and there have been multiple modifications of this procedure, uh, including the docking technique, which was first done by David Alchek, and the Dane technique, which was a, a hybrid by Alchek and Eltrosh, which was a modification of the docking technique. All of these procedures effectively reconstruct or repair or place a piece of tissue back where it was. And it's important to know what the anatomy in this region is. So this is a study we did. We, we did some three-space digitizing of the, of the native UCL and where it attaches. And you can see the kind of bullseye on the left. That's the anterior face of the medial epicondyle. It's important to note that distal is facing the bottom of the screen and that's not where it attaches. It attaches a little bit more anterior on the face. It does not attach at the joint line. Um, and those dots going vertically around the joint show that. And then the distal attachment, um, which, is, which is down on the ulna is very long, a couple of centimeters long. And that's also important when we talk about reconstruction and repair. So our technique, we start with a posterior approach. We don't do a muscle splitting approach. We, we prefer a posterior approach to elevate the muscle. So this is a little bit longer incision than what you do with the muscle splitting approach, but it gives us great exposure and gives us access to the nerve and the back of the elbow. So this is kind of the utilitarian approach to the elbow. Um, it's, it's centered over the posterior aspect of the medial epicondyle. Um, we do, we do find the nerve and you can see the nerve tracking there. I, I didn't do these as videos because we only had 15 minutes, but we do isolate the nerve in all of these cases. There was a time where I wasn't isolating the nerve doing the repair. And I found that I was going back to do some ulnar nerve transpositions in people that I hadn't. So my way of looking at, the, is that, at that, and I'll say it later, is I, I've never wished I hadn't done an ulnar nerve transposition, but there have been a few times where I wish I had. We, we then elevate the muscle, and this slide shows how we pull the muscle up off of the ligament. 
we don't split the muscle. We, we try to avoid damaging the muscle. We want to lift it up rather than split it. And that gives us great exposure of the underlying UCL. So here's the UCL. And we'll place a split longitudinally in that from the sublime tubercle on the left to the right at the medial epicondyle. So we can split right into the fibers of the UCL and, and show it uh, and expose it. We can see the underside of it. We can see the actual tear. We can see the quality of the tissue, which is really important. Um, tissue quality is a really important concept in this operation, as is what else is in the ligament. If there's bony uh, ossicles in the ligament or if there's fatty replacement or gelatinous replacement of the ligament, we need to be able to see that. We can then drill tunnels for the UCL graft. These are done anterior and posterior to the sublime tubercle. You can see the drill guide on the bottom of the screen. This is away from the joint. So we're at least four or five millimeters away from the joint to create a, a big enough bridge that we don't risk fracturing out into the joint. Um, I don't know that I've seen that happen. So our, our, our five or six millimeter distal uh, tunnel is certainly enough of a bridge. And, and these are about a centimeter apart when we make them to create a, a round tunnel. So this is actually a video of passing the graft. So um, this is being passed from proximal to distal. So it's through the medial epicondyle. And then we've passed loop sutures through the curved tunnel in the ulna. So I've got the graft through the uh, longitudinal tunnel in the medial epicondyle. And now I'm gonna pull the graft uh, through the uh, ulnar tunnel. So I've got these loops that I can do that with, and you're gonna see, I can pull this all the way through the tunnel um, and uh, nicely slide it through there. Um, we wanna avoid trapping the graft on itself. So you kind of see sometimes this can turn into a little bit of spaghetti, but ultimately we, we can easily get the graft uh, through the tunnels. So now I've got the graft through the proximal aspect of the medial epicondyle on the right, through the ulna, and now I'm going to bring it back on itself. This is kind of the figure of eight uh, concept, which is the modified Job technique um, that Dr. Andrews popularized. And so now I've got this figure of eight graft um, through a tunnel in the ulna on the left and a, two tunnels in the humerus on the right, kind of a Y-shaped tunnel. And I can then tie those to each other, sew them down, and, and that recreates the, uh, the, the ligament. That creates the ligament reconstruction with the native ligament underneath it. So the native UCL is closed prior to tensioning. The graft is sewn to itself um, and then uh, sewn to itself in the underlying native ligament below the medial epicondyle. We typically do this in about 20 degrees of elbow flexion and we're constantly checking elbow flexion to make sure we haven't over constrained the elbow uh, through this process. We do an ulnar nerve transposition in every one of these. And from the time I got to Birmingham back in 1999, every single reconstruction we've done is at an ulnar nerve transposition. And as I said before, I've never regretted doing a transposition, but there have been times when I haven't done it with the repair that I wished I had. So uh, I've circled back to doing it in every one of those as Dr. Andrews taught me. The results of this, this is a, about a four month average return to starting a throwing program. In our big study, we had about a 10 month average to competitive throwing and about a year for professional players. We know that at the MLB level, you know, the, it may take a little bit longer. Some of those are seasonality issues, but on the average, we tell people this is about a 12 month recovery back from UCL reconstruction. We had 81% of major league professional players that were able to return and basically the same results over a large scale study. We published on over 1200 of these out of our institution over a 10 year period. We had an 85% return to play at the same or higher level an average of 12 months with a very low complication rate. And I would say, as I think most people would, this is still the gold standard operation. This has not been knocked off the block and is still the gold standard. It's interesting though, to talk about history because if you look back, interestingly, uh, Lyle Norwood was the first to report on repair, but in Frank Job's original article that Conway was the uh, first author in, which was published in 1992, including Tommy John, they had 70 patients dating back to 1974. That was Tommy John. But in there, there were 14 repairs back to bone, 56 reconstructions as we now know it, and 14 repairs to bone. And if you see the Major League Baseball data below, 12 out of 16 or 75% of the major leaguers got back with reconstruction, but only 30% with repair. And so Dr. Joe rightfully abandoned repair as a bad idea. Dr. Andrews published with one of his then fellows, Fred Azar, uh, 91 UCL reconstructions. And in that group, they had some repairs as well. And again, only about 30% of these patients that had repairs got back to the same level of play. 
And so the two giants of, of UCL surgery in our, in our country's history, and probably the third one would be Lou Yoakum. Th these were, this was abandoned. UCL repair was abandoned rightfully because it didn't work. But there was a lot of things that were different then that, that we may, maybe not the same now. Buddy Savoy then fast forward about 15 years. Buddy, Buddy looked at UCL repairs and published this in the trade journal, the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2006 and 2008. The first one in female athletes and he did a combination of anchors and repairs in, in softball players, gymnasts, tennis, and they got back in three months and, and nobody paid much attention to this. And I would tell you that Buddy is, again, another truly genuinely excellent elbow surgeon, but people didn't really pay much attention to this. And then he did it, he repeated the study in, in male overhead athlete or in, in overhead athletes, largely male. So these were largely high school and college baseball players. And he had 58 out of 60 return to the same or higher level play at six months. Now, what's, what's different here? Well, prior to 2017, there were less than 200 cases of, of repair with generally poor outcomes until Buddy kind of reported on a little bit of a change. And so maybe there was a renewed interest. And, and we had to ask ourselves as we started thinking about repair, are we defining insanity by trying to do something that didn't work the first time? And, it, and maybe it's not going to work again. There were also in revisions, you know, revision reconstruction is not a good operation. And I think everybody on the panel would tell you, this is one of our least favorite operations to do, one of our least favorite operations to rehab. The outcomes are not good. It takes forever to get back at the Major League Baseball level. It's a year and a half to get back plus, and the success rates are just not that good. So this was something that maybe repair with an internal brace would be a positive thing for because this is just not a great outcome group. The thing about the athletes that we wanted to try the repair in is that these are typically younger athletes with end avulsions or partial tears where the tissue quality is really not an issue. These are not beat up ligaments. These are people that have lower level injuries. And so the thought was after cutting into 1200 plus of these things over a long time is some of the pathology we saw just, just wasn't really that bad. And was UCL reconstruction really necessary for all these people? So this is the internal brace, which was really developed by Gordon Mackay, a foot and ankle surgeon in Scotland. It's two peak or plastic anchors. These are 3.5 millimeter anchors with a collagen dipped tape suture in, in between them and another super suture on the end. So this is the construct that we call the internal brace. It was first used in the ankle and has now been adapted in lots of file and lots of anatomic places. So this was the repair. We anchor it at both ends and we sew it down to the underlying ligament and we repair the end avulsion. So wherever the injury is, we repair it just like Buddy did in his study. So these are two different MRIs. The one on the left is good tissue that's elevated off the sublime tubercle. That, that ligament tissue, if you didn't see that avulsion off the sublime tubercle, you would say that's a pretty normal and healthy looking piece of ligament. That's very different than the one you see on the right, which is this gray gelatinous stuff that, that comes off this big enthesophyte off the ulna. That's a huge tissue deficiency. When you open that up, that's gonna be bad tissue. When you take that bone spur off, there's gonna be a tissue deficiency. There is no room for repairing that kind of thing. That, that's going to be bad. The one on the left, I think you could at least consider repairing it, but it still should be a game time decision based on what you see. Same thing here on the left, there's no real bone issue. On the right, there's this projecting osteophyte that almost touches the, the medial epicondyle. There's no way you can take that off and make that work with, with a UCL repair. That needs a reconstruction and likely needs a hamstring graft to create more collagen. So here's the video for the reconstruction. We make the same posterior approach we always do. We find the medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve. We dissect it out. We find the ulnar nerve. I've been transposing the ulnar nerve in every one of these now. So we find the ulnar nerve, we isolate it. Then we elevate the muscle off the UCL. So this is the same muscle elevating approach we always use. And then we're gonna split the ligament. So there's the UCL. We're gonna split the ligament from distal to proximal. So I'm protecting the nerve posteriorly. We're going to go from distal to proximal and expose the ligament. Now this person's got a posterior tear or a distal tear rather. So you're going to see that we can easily see the uh, avulsion right there off of the sublime tubercle. I shouldn't be able to see all that bone right there. Ligament tissue should be covering that up and it's just elevated off a of bone. So that's a pretty obvious distal tear. So our first anchor goes in right there. First anchor goes in at the repair, at the repair site. So where we're going to actually repair the injury. You can see the anchor going in there. This gets uh, turned into place and deposited into that bone tunnel. 
um, the tape and the and the repair suture are in the eyelet that got dunked into the tunnel. And so then we're going to take that suture and repair the native ligament. So I can pull the tape out of the way and I can repair that native ligament down. And that basically accomplishes what Buddy did. So in the study that Buddy had, where he showed, you know, almost 95% getting back in six months with these type of injuries, this is all he did. He just put an anchor in and sewed it down. In the course of starting to think about doing this, Buddy was a great resource. He, he encouraged me to do this and thought that, you know, adding to what he was doing would be helpful. Um, and so we thought, you know, gosh, if we could do what Buddy's doing and then throw this tape in there and uh, with some biology in it, it does have collagen on it. Maybe this would have created an even stronger uh, uh, situation than, than what Buddy had. So I've now passed these sutures through here. I'm going to tie that down and that repairs the ligament back where it came from. Then I'm going to close up the split that I made side to side. We don't want to cut across any of the fibers of the UCL. So we'll close this back up side to side. I'll put two or three of those in there and close that back up. And then I'm going to drill my, my humeral tunnel. So this is the space I'm going to drill the humeral tunnel. It's important to be on that anterior face where we showed that anatomy, where the uh, fibers attach. We don't want to be distal or posterior. We want to be up there on the anterior face. So we're going to drill this into the medial epicondyle, and then we're going to take the, uh, the second anchor. We're going to tap that hole so we, we create a, a nice spot for the anchor. This is an oversized tap, so we don't have any problems with breaking the anchor. And then we're going to um, put the anchor in there. And, and I purposefully made this one a little short, so this is going to be a little tight the first time. So we tap the anchor in there, and then we go to flex the elbow up, and this one's too tight. It's, it's indenting the ligament. It's not going to bend. I can't really bend the elbow up far enough. So I got to pull that back out. And these things are in there pretty good. So I got to pull that back out and then give it a little bit more length and then put it back in and try it again. So we get to titrate in, you know, how much tension there is in the ligament. Now I'm not indenting the ligament and I can go through a full range of motion without creating over compression of the native ligament. And that's it. That's the internal brace. So with the recent success by Buddy and the basic science showing time zero success, we did our first one in a human on 8-8-2013, so just over seven years ago. We've now done about 500 of these in Birmingham, but we published a study on the first 128. Um, we had a 17 loss to FOB, so we followed up to 87% of these. They were average age 18, all dominant arms, mostly baseball. And the level of play, as you'd imagine, was mostly high school and college. Um, there were a few middle school and one professional, and we've not seen any difference based on level of play. It's important to know the KJOC scores. So a healthy professional pitcher is about 91. Um, and a history of upper extremity surgery was about 75. So at the 87% FOB, we had 92% return to play at the same or higher level with a KJOC score at 24 months of 91. So that was the same as the healthy pitcher. And the average return time was only 6.7 months. This is considerably different than reconstruction. About half of them had an ulnar nerve transposition. There did not seem to be any difference. As I said, I've been transposing all of them lately. Proximal or distal or partial complete made no difference either. No, no difference in location or extent of injury. There were no major complications, although one person did develop heterotopic bone and ultimately had to have a revision to a reconstruction that Chris Ahmad did. He returned to full competition and Chris has said it was the easiest revision he ever did because there were no bone issues. And these guys all returned to play, the people who had the minor complications. So full range of motion by six weeks. And I'm not going to go into the rehab part of this. Kevin's going to cover it. But all these guys are getting back to baseball at the six to seven month time frame. This is the alpha patient. And they sent me this video about five months after his surgery. And I thought, man, I thought I had a good idea here. And you guys are trying to ruin this. But um, they said they couldn't slow him down. So this is a guy named Mark Johnson, who's now a firefighter. But uh, he was our first one. He went on to play some junior college ball. So these are largely high school and collegiate athletes. The first major league baseball player was done by George Paletta in June of 2016. It took him about nine or 10 months to get back. Um, there have been a lot of increase, a significant increase in the professionals over the last couple of years. In fact, two of them with this, with this procedure in the past were just drafted in the June draft. Lots of gymnasts and cheerleaders and wrestlers, they all have a different outcome in terms of the time back. It's the shorter time back, but they all have done pretty well. Interestingly, I've revised five previous reconstructions. Um, four have returned to play at the same or higher level, and, and one is less than six months out. Um, the most recent one was a 39-year-old major leaguer who's actually pitching tonight. 
Um, he pitched seven seasons after his reconstruction, had onset of symptoms last summer and couldn't complete the season. You can see this big detachment of his large mass of, re, of, of uh, ligament reconstruction and, and uh, his native ligament off the medial epicondyle. And so you can see this big hole in the middle picture where he uh, evolved off his ligament and then we put the repair in there. So um, he's, he's back to pitching. He, he pitched his first major league game at eight plus months uh, back from, from repair. So my thoughts are that as with other ligamentous injuries in the body, end avulsions of the UCL can be repaired back. Partial thickness tears can be augmented. With the addition of an ultra strong biologically enhanced tape and modern technology, um, we may be needing to rethink some of these operations. It's not a ligament replacement. And the people who need more tissue still need more tissue. The people with bone problems and tissue deficiencies still need reconstructions. It may be a better option for revision than reconstruction. And, and I, I think there's a, you know, I think ulnar nerve transposition is, is perfectly good. So people ask my opinion of revising with internal brace. I, again, I can point to Chris Amad. I've now done two of these and I will say they are easier revisions than, than revising a reconstruction for sure. They're, they're not hard to do because there's no bone deficits. Um, so I have cautious optimism in patients with partial thickness injuries. I'm not likely to use this in people who have attritional ruptures or poor quality tissue. And we're now starting to see this moving into higher levels of sports. So that's kind of the how and why of, of UCL surgery. Um, you know, it's an intraoperative one. I, I consent every patient for repair and reconstruction. I think it's important to talk to them about this. This is very much a conversation thing with patients. They need to understand it. Um, and, and they need to understand the hows and the whys. So this same conversation I'm having with you, I have with virtually every patient that wants to talk about it. So as always, there's a lot more to learn. And, um, and we continue to push that envelope. So thank you all very much. And um, I look forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Great, thank you, Dr. Dugas. That was an excellent overview of the indications and some technical pearls. And now we'll shift gears to post-operative rehab. So this will be Dr. Kevin Wilk talking about UCL rehabilitation, differences between reconstruction and repair. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. That was a great presentation, Dr. Dugas, and I'll, I'll try to uh, dovetail that with our rehabilitation program. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. We're good. So it's a pleasure to uh, be involved with just such uh, excellent faculty and congratulations to ASMI, to say the least. So as we know, and as Dr. Andrews mentioned, elbow injuries are on the increase, especially in baseball. And it it's also in the 12 year old as well as in the professional athlete. The rehab has to match the surgery. And as Dr. Dugas mentioned, uh, Tommy John surgery was done quite a few years ago and it took basically about 16 months for him to make it back. What I find interesting is he actually had more wins after the surgery than before. And he pitched for 15 years after that surgery. So a lot of times people will say, well, how long will this last? Well, it should last quite a long time uh, also became a different pitcher. I grew up in Chicago and I saw Tommy John pitch when he was with the Chicago White Sox when I was actually pretty young, to say the least. So this is Tommy John with Dr. Frank Job, uh, the late Frank Job at the uh, Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I had the honor of talking to Dr. Job for an interview for the Journal of Sports Health. It was a dedicated issue for the, uh, for the elbow. And Dr. Job was quite gracious in telling me really what he was thinking about uh, as far as doing the surgery and dealing with people like Sandy Koufax before and, and things of that nature. So uh, fortunately, I was able to interview him about two years before he passed away. So as we mentioned, elbow injuries are on the increase. Uh, it happens in gymnasts, as was mentioned, high-level athletes, but also youth baseball players as well. As far as a, a reference for the rehabilitation and athletic trainers on this particular call, uh, we wrote a paper this year in the uh, Clinics of Sports Medicine. It's a dedicated issue on elbow. Dr. Dugas was the guest uh, editor, and I would urge you to take a look at that particular issue, It'll get you up to speed quite nicely. We also wrote a paper last year on the rehab of UCL repairs in JOSPT. So those two references are very good from the rehab. A couple things about incidents. Uh, this is from Stan Conti's work. What we're noticing over the last five or six years is the number of shoulder surgeries in Major League Baseball are on the decrease and the number of elbow surgeries are on the increase. 
And as Dr. Andrews mentioned, it's almost an epidemic proportion as the news reports in Sports Illustrated. And it's certainly happening at our institution here in Birmingham, where we're seeing more and more youth as well as high school players having surgery, as you can see over the last 15 years. So it's, it's a flip-flop. When I first started here, it was mainly an adult surgery, and now it's 60, 62% adolescent, and about 40% uh, to 38% adult. This was a study by Chris Ahmad that showed in New York over a 10-year period, it's a 200% increase in the number of UCL surgeries, which is pretty staggering to say the least. This is some work from Brandon Erickson, American Journal of Sports Medicine, looking at which age is most likely to sustain a UCL injury and surgery. And the most common age is that 14 to 15 year old. Been given an opportunity as one of the only players, the only Schmoll. one not right now to be inducted in the Hall of Fame with Tommy John surgery. It's an epidemic. It's something that is affecting our game. It's something that I thought would cost me my career, but thanks to Dr. James Andrews and all those before him, performing the surgery with such precision has caused it to be almost a false read like a Band-Aid you put on your arm. I want to encourage the families and parents that are out there to understand that this is not normal to have a surgery at 14 and 15 years old. That you have time, that baseball is not a year-round sport. That you have an opportunity to be athletic and play other sports. Don't let the institutions that are out there running before you guarantee in scholarship dollars and, and signing bonuses that this is the way. We have such great dynamic arms in our game that it's a shame that we're having one and two and three Tommy John recipients. So I want to encourage you, if nothing else, know that your children's passion and desire to play baseball is something that they can do without a competitive pitch. So hopefully that makes sense. And uh, John gave a great speech at the Hall of Fame, and I would urge you to take a look at the uh, full version of that. That's just a little clip. Stan, Conti, and I did a study uh, looking at Major League Baseball players and the incidence of Tommy John surgery, 25% at the big league level in 2015, and about 14% in the minor league level. A follow-up study a few years later in 19, 2019 showed an increase at the minor league level, but major league about the same. So what are those risk factors? And you might say, you know, I need to talk about rehab, but we need to know the risk factors. So while we're rehabbing these individuals, we can make a case for what you need to do after the rehab. In Major League Baseball, the average of fastball velocity has increased over the last 10 years, and so has the number of UCL surgeries. A study by Chalmers, as well as Erickson, pointed out the number one risk factor for an injury to your elbow at the Major League level or professional baseball is peak pitch velocity. And that's what John Smoltz was mentioning, competitive pitches, hard throwing. So you're throwing at maximal velocity. Well, what about these guys, these youngsters that we see, which the majority of clinicians on this call are probably seeing? Well, we've done a lot of work here at ASMI, Dr. Fleisick and Dr. Andrews and Dugas and Kane and a variety of other investigators. And the number one risk factor for kids are pitching when you're fatigued in proper throwing mechanics. As Mike Reinhold is going to talk about a little bit, I hope, weighted balls, weighted ball throwing programs. He's done some excellent work in that particular area. Dr. Fleisig studied the effects of long distance throwing, max distance and showing increased forces at the elbow. And then we have the specialization, playing only one sport at an early age, which is a major problem. John Smoltz played three sports. Tom Glavin played two sports growing up, hockey and baseball. Greg Maddox played two sports and so forth. Poor conditioning, weakness in the legs and the hip, which causes compromise in your arm. Year round baseball showcases and just too many competitive throws and as John mentioned in his Hall of Fame speech just not a fun environment for these young people to participate in. Dr. Dugas mentioned our outcomes already. I think we can improve on the reconstruction outcomes. I think we can get to 90 percent and 93 percent similar to what he had with the repairs. This was a study by Erickson and I think you should take this to heart. I talked to Brandon this afternoon actually about this study and some other things. And what he looked at was the time to play after a primary UCL reconstruction, and if it made a difference, whether or not you had a problem. In other words, after the reconstruction. So he had a revision group that went back at 14 months, meaning that they had a primary, but did they fail? And you had a second group, which went back at 16 months and had no failure. So it's a two month difference as far as returning 
to throwing, but also returning to the same level. Even though there was no statistical difference, it seems as though that two months is a, a clinical real difference. And we need to keep that in mind as far as speeding them up. So what's new in rehab? Well, it's like Christmas, you know, you get new gifts and new toys. One of the things that we've gotten over the last couple of years, thanks to some brilliant researchers, is the MODIS system, which is the sleeve that we use in our clinic here when they go to throw next door at ASMI and outside. And it just has a sensor. And Glenn can maybe talk about this at the end because he helped in the development. So we can tell if you're overthrowing during your rehabilitation, it gives us workload which Mike is gonna talk about quite a bit with the throwing program. Also biomechanics. When a person's throwing, many times they're doing it on their own and maybe uh, experience or uh, exhibit altered biomechanics, poor mechanics. So I'm fortunate ASMI is right next door to our biomechanics lab, but many times we don't run, run cameras. So we use apps on our phone or on our uh, iPad. We use Coach Our Video or Coach My Video. And we can show the athlete if their mechanics are off. If you can't see it, you can't adjust. I think you would agree, these two young ladies, you would not return them back to volleyball if you saw them jump off a box like that. But many times we return a young man like this back to baseball because we've never seen him throw or her throw if she's a softball player. So we need to observe this and video it. Radar guns. Scouts and coaches love velocity, but radar guns can be used positively to make sure that you're not overthrowing at inappropriate time frames. There's more to the elbow than the elbow. This was a study from the Curl and Job Clinic that correlated scapular dyskinesis with hip weakness, doing a step down test. So us, as we do our rehabilitation for our UCL patients, we integrate legs into the equation. This is a professional baseball pitcher after a Tommy John surgery doing a front step down, especially with young people. One of the major weakness areas that young people have is posterior chain, hips, and quads, and they throw with their arm. Lateral slides, one of the best exercises you can do for a lateral hip. In the Journal of Strength and Conditioning, it's been pointed out, if your push-off leg, if your throwing side leg is weak in the hip, you will drop your hip and you will lead with your elbow, which will lead to more stress on the medial side. Secondarily, you'll actually lose velocity. So you can tell the young person by getting strong hips, you'll actually throw harder, which is a way of getting them to throw properly and do leg exercises. And we'll do this early after UCL. Here's a guy three weeks post, a professional. Now again, with young people, I would probably hold off quite a few more weeks just in case they went to catch the ball with their throwing side integrating in more planking and exercises like this, trying to bring the entire body into the equation. For me, an individual who's maybe two months post-op or greater, I don't want them laying on the table and doing the exercises. I'd rather have them on a stability ball or moving as you see in these slides here with TheraBand and so forth. This is a quarterback coming back from an elbow injury where he's doing lateral slides with external rotation, integrating the entire body into the exercise, trying to make it more functional. Here's a volleyball player in the sideline position, doing a plank, integrating her hips and her legs into the equation as well. Emphasizing endurance at all times. Dr. Andrews and Dr. Fleissig pointed out, as you fatigue, the number of injuries dramatically go up. So we wanna emphasize endurance. So this person is doing these ball drops. It's two pound balls. He's over the edge of the table and he'll do this for 30 seconds. And it's one of the exercises they'll do at the end. Here we're doing medicine ball, throws up against the wall with TheraBand around his wrist to resist the internal rotators. And we can do that into external rotation as well, working on dynamic stabilization. BFR, very controversial in baseball players. I have used it in the elite level. I've resisted using it at younger high school and so forth because of thoracic outlet type problems. But if the mature thrower, professional baseball player has some thinning of their cuff and is facing maybe career ending surgery or maybe just career ending, I will entertain blood flow restriction trying to get collagen lay down and also increase growth factors. These exercises are on my, my Instagram. We also have developed a return to play criteria eight tests that we use 
to make sure that that individual is ready to begin a throwing program, that their legs and their arms, as well as the core of the body, has been reconditioned. Mike's going to talk about this. This is something that I'm, I'm totally in favor of, throwing programs based on workloads and doing deloading. And, and again, Mike will talk about this. A couple things about UCL when we talk about rehab. Person gets injured. Well, one way that they can continue perhaps without surgery is just not pitching. Pitchers get hurt at a higher rate than any other position. About two-thirds to 70% of all injuries to a team is to the pitcher. Or you can rehab them and perhaps get them back to pitching. Or you can have a reconstruction or a repair. And at our center, as Dr. Dugas mentioned, we see a lot of elbow surgeries. So what is the comparison in the rehab? Well, the repair is quicker than the reconstruction, obviously. It's less surgery and so forth. So we both use brace, uh, both procedures use a brace for seven days, locked at 90 degrees, and then the eighth gate day, they begin range of motion exercises. Generally, full range of motion is accomplished with the brace group somewhere around four to six weeks, whereas the reconstruction group closer to six to eight weeks. The Thrower's 10 isotonic program begins at three weeks, where the reconstruction starts at four weeks plyometric six weeks compared to 12 weeks. And this is when it gets a little bit more spaced out once you hit that three month mark. The internal brace group will begin throwing at eight to 10 weeks where the reconstruction starts at four months and return to play is somewhere between five to six months for the brace group and nine to 12 months for the reconstructed group. In particulars, as you can see here on the screen, we, we advocate a isotonic program for the entire body. Our Throwers 10 program has been published in several locations, as well as our Advanced Throwers 10 program. Quickly, what about the rehabilitation for the reconstruction? Uh, at our center here in Birmingham, Dr. Kane, Dr. Dugas, and Dr. Andrews use a modified Job procedure, as you heard, predominantly palmaris longus, but occasionally gracilis as well. We do not use the docking procedure here, but at a lot of centers they do. The rehab is slightly different. The phases are actually six, We've increased that from four, trying to space things out to keep the athlete more involved. So for the first eight weeks, it's scapula, some light shoulder exercises, some light elbow, and then at eight weeks starts more aggressive exercises. At 12 weeks, we start the advanced throwers program, as I mentioned, plyometrics, and at four months, interval throwing program, which will be discussed next. As the interval throwing program gets progressed, then they'll go off the mound somewhere between eight to 10 months and return to play again as variable depending on the time. I wanna mention one or two things about range of motion and graph sight and I'll wrap this up. In the past, we used this posterior splint. Now we use a brace locked at 90 degrees and really the range of motion has progressed as quickly as a person can tolerate. The only thing I'll mention about the range of motion that I think should be noted is this is a study from the University of Michigan that put strain gauges in cadavers and took them through an arc of motion. And they looked at the anterior portion as well as the posterior portion of the ligament and didn't really see much stress on the anterior band. This is some work from George Paletta out of St. Louis that documented this killer curve synonymous to the PCL. And I've noticed this with uh, UCL reconstructions and some repairs as well, which don't exhibit a curve in a repair. But as you get into more of a flex position, about 110 or so, people will talk about discomfort on their UCL, sometimes sharp pain. So I have over the last six months to eight months really backed off on the reconstructions pushing flexion. I just let it calm down and so forth. Dr. Paletta thinks that could be a source of graph irritation. Last thing to mention is the location of the graph source, the palmaris longus. For the first two weeks, we don't do much at all for that particular location, but after that, we'll do soft tissue, stretching, instrumented soft tissue as well, and laser that particular area as well. Gracilis grafts, which is actually my favorite for these individuals to get for a lot of reasons. Uh, we tell them no hamstrings, no stretching your calf for a good four to six weeks. Leave the tissue alone, but just do some soft tissue as well. We talked about our muscle training program, isotonics and so forth. And it's really important for you to realize that the Throwers 10 program is bilateral, we use a lot of weighted balls, and I think we do a lot of manual techniques as well. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop there.
And again, you can look at our, our programs in those two articles, but we also have them online at ASMI.org. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm gonna stop my share now so Mike can begin. Great, that, excellent talk, Kevin, as expected. Thank you again. We're gonna to toss things up now to Dr. Mike Reinhold to discuss updated interval throwing program. You might make sure you unmute. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I had to, I get, I have two monitors going. I probably shouldn't have two monitors going, but <laughs> how's that going? Does that, uh, yep. that, does that show my presentation? Yep. You're up. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks so much. And obviously, uh, it's an honor to be part of such a really special program tonight, um, brought to you by ASMI. Um, always humbling to follow Dr. Dugas and Dr. Wilk, obviously with, um, such awesome presentations. Um, I'm going to be discussing now some of our, our newer concepts with our interval throwing programs that we perform in general and really kind of like show you how we apply that to our Tommy John procedures um, after um, we get through some of the basics. So I have no disclosures, but again, proud to be part of the ASMI family and, and again, always eager to participate participate, excuse me, in this type of presentation to help everybody get a little bit better at this and to share our knowledge. So thanks as always to ASMI for putting this together. As you all know, interval throwing programs are super important, right? Gradual return to sport is necessary so that we can slowly apply load to the body over time. And what we want to do during this procedure, especially a Tommy John procedure, is make sure that we are allowing the body to adapt to the stress. And this is the new tissue, the reconstructed ligament or even the repaired ligament has to slowly be able to apply this, these new loads. So oftentimes when we build our interval return to really any sport, but throwing in particular, we want to slowly manipulate the variables. And the variables we use for throwing obviously is the intensity of throws, the volume of throws, the frequency of throws, and, and really how we apply that to baseball has a lot to do with the distance of throws and our velocity, right? Those are usually some of the uh, variables that we'll manipulate. We do have to remember that stress is cumulative over time. So the more we throw in terms of frequency and duration and down periods and deload weeks also becomes important as the athlete progresses over their rehabilitation protocol. So we're going to talk a little bit about this and how we prefer to safely build load. Because for me, it's really, really important that we avoid going too fast or too slow and performing this roller coaster type ride after surgery where somebody has to be sped up or slowed down because we are not progressing at the right pace. So for me, it's always best to be gradual and progressive. So one of the things that we've started to pay a little bit more attention to in our rehabilitation process is the concept of acute chronic workload ratios. So obviously you've followed the work of Dr. Tim Gabbett. Um, Tim Gabbett has obviously published a ton of research on this in various sports. But what we want to do is we under, want to understand the acute and chronic stresses that are being applied to the elbow and the new reconstructed ligament. So what we do is we develop both of these workloads over time and the ratio of them where we define as a one week period for the acute stresses and a four week period for the chronic stresses. And if you take the ratio of that, oftentimes what we can come up with is an acute chronic workload ratio that has been shown in the literature to correlate to injury rates. So again, if we discuss some of the work by Tim Gabbett, we know that we have seen that acute chronic workload ratios that are above approximately 1.2 to 1.3 have been shown to increase injury rates in almost every particular sport that we can think of in European soccer players with hamstring injuries and cricket players for their, for their throwing arm as well, but also in baseball players, which has been recently published in physical therapy and sport in 2019, showing that an acute chronic workload ratio of greater than 1.27 had a 15 times more likelihood to see an injury. So what does that mean? What does that acute chronic workload ratio mean? We're going to talk about this when we apply it to our new throwing protocols, but essentially with, with an acute chronic workload ratio of 1.27, or we'll just round up to, to 1.3 to make it easier. What that means essentially is that for a one week period over a one month 
period, it's slowly progressed at a 30% rate over time. And to me, that's an important concept that we do. Each week, you slowly want to add about 10% effort. So that way you can slowly apply these different chronic loads over time. So when we look at traditional interval throwing programs, oftentimes what people discuss is the ones that we published from, from Birmingham. So Kevin, myself, some of our colleagues through, through Major League Baseball with Jamie Reed and Ken Crenshaw, we published this in 2002. And it was really based on our best understanding of how the body worked and how to develop an appropriate workload. And I, I honestly think that Kevin, who you know, came up with this program uh, many decades ago now, I think he did an amazing job at the time of taking our best guess at what an appropriate workload progression would be. We now have the technology that can monitor that and make it precise and make sure we're following that. But at the time, we developed a very strict program that wasn't probably the most functional. It was a little bit more rehabby than baseball, but it used distance and perceived effort to dictate the intensity and to slowly develop over time. Since then, I think most other ones published have been variations of that, except for one, maybe with Dr. Axe and Sports Health in 2009, which tried to use data from simulated games. But I think the game data, right, if, you're only, if, if, if that's the primary reason how you're developing a traditional ITP, I think the game data is probably not enough because there's so much throwing that happens before for the game and in between the games. So I don't even think that was necessarily the best. But again, at the time before we had the technology, that was the best we had. And I think we did a good job, but I have a secret. We published this in 2002. Don't tell anybody, this is just between us, the few hundred people that are on this, this presentation right here. I haven't used the throwing program we published for about 15 years. So don't tell anyone that, I apologize. We've been working on a new one for years and have slowly kind of built that. And we're actually getting really close to finally publishing this. But traditionally it was always set and rep based, right? Three times a week, we, we had what we felt were unnecessary breaks, these five to 10 minute rest periods that were between the sets that we'd often get rid of. Uh, there was really no progression between the steps. Just went from a chunk of 45 to 60 feet to 90 feet and potentially had some spikes and plateaus because of that. So what we wanted to do is develop a new interval throwing program that to me, I think this is how I would define it. It's starting with the end in mind. It's starting with this person right here. And what I wanted to say is, what is this person going to do one year from surgery that we need to prepare their body for? And I think that's the most appropriate way before. Instead of building a set rep scheme to get them to slowly build progression, I wanted to start with the end in mind. So we wanted to have a modernized approach that was familiar to players, right? Not set rep based. And trust me, set and rep base is fantastic. You know, 20 throws at 45 feet, that actually, it works well, but it doesn't sink well in the baseball player's mind, which you're probably familiar with, right? They want to slowly step back their throws. They want to have different throws at different distances. They want to script all that out. Now, Kevin and I, we've been teaching people how to do this throwing program for decades now. Of course, we instructed them to do it this way. But when you have this protocol that's out in the literature and just, you know, someone randomly in the middle of Montana picks it up and works with their first baseball player that they've ever worked with, they're probably going to follow it verbatim. So what we wanted to do is we want to sequence this all out. Each day has a slight progression. There's no two days that are exactly the same. And then over time, we're going to have light days, heavy days, multiple days in a row and progress them to where they need to be at the end of the year. Because we can't take breaks. We can't just throw Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example. So we started this development with past biomechanical studies. Dr. Glenn Fleissig showed long toss increases stress, especially as we get to max distances. So we knew that the longer we progressed out our long toss programs, we know the stress would increase. So we put that into consideration. We saw from Slanker and ASM in 2014 that pull downs and partial efforts also changed the workloads that we saw during interval throwing programs. So we put that together. But then what really started to crack the, the code was, was from Ben Hansen from MODIS who Kevin referred to in his presentation, but Ben Hansen really and I started to sit down and say, how do we develop a new program? And Ben, how can you validate it? I'm not gonna take any of the credit, Ben's the man. Ben's the one that came up with all the validation for this that can run it through these models. So what we did is we used the MODIS database to establish an estimated workload at each distance. We based this on about a quarter of a million throws and 30 D1 NCAA pitchers. And we showed this correlation between distance and stress. And this has been published by other people as well. And we built this model to evalu evaluate our interval throwing program. So if you see over time by just using this, this, this uh, large database of the MODIS uh, torque to distance ratios, that we saw this curve and we could then estimate the amount of stress that happens at each step. So if we assign a specific workload to each throw, and then we can therefore quantify the entire throwing procedure 
and have all of this objectively quantified over time. So while traditional ITPs did a good job, they were really close. They had a couple of things that we didn't love when we analyzed this with our simulated models. One is they peaked a little bit too early. Two is that they plateaued later in the progression. And then I think the jump from the end of the interval throwing program to a game environment may have been too much. So to kind of look at that like a little bit more in detail, which you can kind of see here, this is an acute chronic workload ratio or the chronic workload buildup over time with our traditional interval throwing programs. You can see it slowly ramped up, but then in the middle of the throwing program really plateaued before it started to ramp up again. My goal was to continue this line so that was a little bit more linear or with some controlled plateaus because we wanted it that way. That didn't last over several weeks, but we wanted to slowly build this up in more of a linear fashion. But more importantly, if you look at the acute chronic workload ratios, anything above this gray line here is greater than a 1.5 acute chronic workload ratio, which again, we showed was correlated to potential injury. You can see early on in the throwing program, we stayed a little bit too far above that ratio that I wanted and then slowly dipped back over time and kind of settled in. I think the goal of any interval throwing program that you develop is to keep this within this gray zone as much as we can over the course of the throwing progression. So based on that, what we did is we took what we thought the modern baseball player needed and based it on our past biomechanical data, our past uh, interval throwing programs to develop it. What we did was come up with a template similar to this. And you can see just like looking as an example here, each day is slightly different. Each day we're slowly adding throws and we're slowly progressing the throws to deeper distances over time. And this is scripted out and gone through the entire progression that we'll kind of go over a little bit when we get to the Tommy Johns. And this is what we found for our chronic workload. You can see a much more linear fashion that goes up over time without a significant plateau. Anytime it does plateau, that's because we intentionally designed it to plateau that way with a deload week. But more importantly, we slowly ramp up over time, deload again, and we get their chronic workload built up to where we want while keeping the acute chronic workload ratio right in its sweet spot. Anytime that we spike and kind of go above, we make the adjustment to get back under into our appropriate acute chronic workload ratio. So that's important to me. Now, one thing to notice right here is the reason why these spikes occurred is because they followed a deload week. You think you can argue, and Ben has told me this, that our, our, our biomechanist with the Chicago White Sox, Ben Hansen, that helped me with this. He's told me here that we could probably get rid of deload weeks. And I, I think biomechanically, we can get rid of deload weeks. Deload weeks probably slow down our progress, but sometimes that's what we need in our athletes. We need to slow them down sometimes. So it's okay if you do that. It's okay if we start the spike. It's not okay if we don't adjust. So this has now allowed us to quantify. And if you look at this nice gradual progression, each day slowly builds up over time with our throwing workload as we progress. So you can see these really contrast one another, the previous interval throwing programs that peak too high and probably don't go enough at the end versus our nice continuous progression over time. If we overlay the two and we try to show the percentage of the program that is at high risk acute chronic workload ratios, you can see in a traditional program that we use, there's a large percentage of our time within the interval throwing program is at too high of a, a, um, a, an acute chronic ratio uh, risk value that we're looking for. So again, it's a progression from a little bit of this, right? The step-based, we're having 25 throws at 60 feet, take a five minute break. 25 throws at 60 feet, take a five minute break. To now being very sequential. Five throws at 45, 10 at 60, 10 at 75, 15 at 90, 10 at 105, 10 at 60, and so forth. It's a very specific scripted program. Now, how do we apply this to Tommy John? Well, for us, we've started to begin it at five months. Not so much at four months anymore. Sometimes we'll still do it at four months and a little bit more of the older population. But at five months, it actually syncs out pretty well. And the majority of time, especially since we're seeing our Tommy Johns progress to, to younger and younger populations, they are deconditioned or not strong enough to probably start the interval throwing program at four months the majority of time in my experience. Most of these kids, they start doing some, some, some aggressive strengthening exercise between eight and 12 weeks, but they weren't strong before they went into surgery. Right. Just when Kevin and I started doing this, you know, 20 years ago for me, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever it was for Kevin, right? Back in the day, they um they they it was different, right? We were doing Tommy Johns on 33-year-old veterans. They were strong, they had chronic tissue over time. So they tended to do well. We could start this throne progression, but the majority of youth just simply aren't ready. So we start at five months and then we have essentially a three-month long toss program and a three-month mound progression. So six total months of throwing. But every six weeks, we do a deload week. Again, that's to slow them down, 
to get them to have a little mental break, which I think has been very helpful, especially for the people that are stuck in rehab assignments or stuck at their spring training facilities or, or maybe even at their colleges and they're not part of the team. It's to get a little mental break every six weeks throughout this progression. That will allow them to get to a rehab assignment at about the 12 month mark and should be able to return to play at about 13 months, which I think is very appropriate for all our age groups. And this is what it looks like in real life. So this is an actual patient of ours. This is an actual player of ours that went through this in spring training. And this is us monitoring his workload ratios as he progressed over time. And you can say anytime that we started to have a little bit of spike, we just adjust. Every time it would go up, we would just adjust and we slowly built up the chronic workload ratio in a nice linear pattern. So now we are in the zone, we can start our rehab assignments and it doesn't have a huge spike in stress as they get back. So we've delayed maybe uh, a little bit of the start of the progression, but I don't think we need to delay the ultimate return or the result. I see some teams in Major League Baseball are saying they're waiting 18 months to come back from surgery. I'm, I'm not quite sure that the, the research validates that. I don't, I don't see the need for that. I haven't seen the need for that really in any of the patients that we've worked with. And it doesn't look like delaying it longer really helps us. To me, it's more about controlling the workload. If you look at some comparative studies for such as Keller's from general shoulder elbow surgery and comparing the Tommy John procedures that did well and needed a revision, they're almost always because of the workloads. So coming back from surgery, their workloads were too high over time. So to me, it all comes down to workloads. It's not how fast do they get back. It's how much were they used afterwards and what was their workload progression? Did they have a big spike coming up after that, right? So that's a lot of the key factors that go into it. Now, what about weighted balls? Just kind of one point I wanted to add. Kevin mentioned this too in his presentations. For us, we don't recommend we use weighted balls during our interval throwing programs. Now, don't get me wrong. We use, interval, we use weighted balls in our plyometrics. That's completely different. I'm talking about max effort throws with weighted balls to work on velocity development. To me, there's no place for this just yet in our interval throwing programs. I'm not even sure there's a place for this in our performance enhancement, but there may be at a certain point. But for us, we're in control of the arm. If you start manipulating variables such as the weight of the ball or the intensity of how much you throw, you completely throw off our equations. You completely throw off our workload uh, um, buildups that we have developed over time, and it's not gonna go quite as well. So for us, we've scripted out now precisely how much we want to add load each day, each week, each month in this progression. It's probably gonna result in more stress over time. So we know weighted balls increase our shoulder external rotation stress on the elbow. We showed this in a couple of our, our, our papers that we've published and Dr. Fleissig's published. There may be a place for it, but probably not in our, our interval throwing programs. So in summary, again, this is more of a modern approach to an interval throwing program. This is what a baseball player does every day. It's just scripted a little bit more towards them. So they feel more comfortable. They feel less like a, a lab rat. They feel less like they're not part of the team. They can't perform a throwing program with everybody else. But it, it's more than that. To me, it's, it's, it's more than just that. It's starting with the end in mind and developing an appropriate progression of chronic workload and making sure that we're keeping our acute chronic workload ratios in pace as we go through this progression. So that way we can have a very gradual return to play. Now, how do you do this, right? That's the easy part for me to kind of say a little bit of our models. Well, the modus sleeve is the way to go right now. So still the modus sleeve, which you can purchase, has this built into the software and will help you get through this progression. We're working on publishing our paper. We've all been talking about this. Everybody on this call and Ben and I have been talking about publishing this paper. We will publish it, but I'll be honest with you, we're still refining it. Ben and I changed three things, I think, at least this summer based on some of our experiences, but I think we're pretty close. So this winter, hopefully we'll get this in publication and we'll have a new template in place that hopefully we can follow that can have even better results over time. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mike. Excellent talk and a great update to the interval throwing program. Our final presentation tonight is gonna to be from our cleanup hitter, our research director here at ASMI, Dr. Glenn Fleissig will be discussing if pitching biomechanics are different after UCL surgery. Oh, very nice, I'm the cleanup hitter. Okay, we'll see how I do here. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about the biomechanics of the pitcher after the UCL surgery. What, some great presentations about the uh, treatment. What about when they get back on the field? Well, let's review first of all, again, how the UCL is stressed. The UCL is stressed in this position. When the arm is cocked back, there's a large varus torque to resist valgus. And the UCL itself has to provide about one third of that torque. We've done some nice uh, studies in the cadaver lab recently, and we've looked at this, and we just published two studies, one in 2016 and one uh, more recently, 
let me just move this thing on my screen here. So I can see it a little better. Um, anyway, we published two studies. And if you haven't seen these, you might want to check these out. These are, are very elaborate studies where we put the elbow in the position uh, that it gets stressed in pitching. And uh, what we found out was we, we checked out the biomechanical strength of the natural elbow with the natural UCL, with the UCL reconstruction, or with the UCL repair. And we found no difference in the failure strength between the UCL reconstruction and the UCL repair. And we also found no difference in the stiffness, which is very important as well. Uh, the UCL repair actually had less gapping, uh, less stretching out in the joint, um, closer to the intact than the reconstruction, but they both seem very good. And the third study, just want to mention about this, we did a third study where we put this uh, tech scan sensor in over here to measure the compression force. And this is in a review right now. And again, with repair versus reconstruction, there is no difference in how much compression there is or contact pressure or area in a repair versus a reconstruction. Uh, the stiffness for both the re reconstruction and the repair was slightly less stiff than the normal elbow, but uh, much better than the torn elbow. So it looks like biomechanically, UCL reconstruction and UCL repair both look like they have the good strength uh, to, uh, for the surgical treatment of the UCL, the torn UCL. So, but when pitchers come back after a UCL surgery, uh, do they display regular uh, mechanics or do they take it easy on their elbow? Well, we did this elaborate study with Major League Baseball published five years ago, Dr. Andrews, myself, and frankly, a lot of colleagues throughout Major League Baseball, because this study looked at 80 baseball pitchers who are professional pitchers from eight different organizations. We found 40 minor leaguers who had had UCL reconstruction, but were back in spring training. And they had had their UCL reconstruction one to four years ago. And for every pitcher in that group, we found a buddy, another teammate, who had never had a UCL surgery, who was about the same level as him. And then they all filled out histories and physicals. We did their range of motion, passive range of motion, external rotation, and internal rotation. And then we put them through a biomechanical test. We took the lab out to spring training, both in Arizona and Florida, and we tested pitchers throwing 10 fastballs either in a bullpen uh, setting or in an indoor lab setting, um, but out at the site of the team. And we used motion analysis, we used ASMI software, and we measured the kinematics, the motions, and the kinetics or the forces uh, for all the groups. And what we found was that we did a good job. We matched a good height and weight and ball velocity, but there was no difference in the passive range of motion or the kinematics or the kinetics between the pitchers who had had a history of UCL reconstruction and the pitchers who had never been hurt. So essentially they look really good. Um, now we did it more recently, we did a, a study, Dr. Dugas and the rest of us, of pitchers who uh, had UCL repair. Now this was just published last year in Orthopedic Journal Sports Medicine. We looked at uh, 66 high school and college pitchers, as Dr. Dugas said, the UCL repair is usually on the younger age uh, pitcher. And uh, for every pitcher there who had a UCL repair, we found one in our database who had never been hurt, uh, who was the same height and weight. I wanna point out that the UCL repair group, we got them in the lab as soon as they were back to 100%. And here's a picture of a pitcher being tested in our lab. Uh, when they showed up, we did their history, their full range of motion. And then we had them throw 10 fastball pitches for the motion analysis collection like here, or like you see behind me. And uh, we compared the pitchers with the UCL repair versus the control group. The UCL repair was back in the lab about 10 months after their surgery. So obviously, uh, as you see here, this is pretty soon. This was really before a UCL reconstruction pitcher would have been in the lab. And uh, what we found was no difference in height and weight because we matched the, those things. No difference in ball velocity. Again, we matched that. No differences in the passive range of motion. The UCL pitchers had had the full external and internal rotation, but we did find a few kinematic differences. The UCL repair group had slightly less elbow extension velocity than the control group. The UCL group also uh, did not extend their elbow quite as far, 27 degrees versus uh, a 
24 degree uh, flexion angle for the control group. So there was a, a, a measurable slight difference in the UCL repair groups, elbow velocity and range of motion during pitching and a statistically significant lower internal rotation velocity. But there were no differences in the kinetics between the uh, repair group and between the uh, control group. So what does this all mean? Well, you know, pitchers are all different levels and uh, different things. And what we did was I just showed you one study where we looked at pitchers who've had UCL reconstruction, who were let's say uh, one to four years, maybe two to three years, most of them, and they were professional pitchers. And that group, that cohort had uh, normal pitching mechanics. They had the same arm speed as their teammates, same body positions and same joint kinetics. The other group study I showed you was the UCL repair, but keep in mind, these were done you know, about 10 months after surgery. And these were a lower level pitcher. These were the college and high school pitchers. They had similar kinetics and mechanics in general, but slightly, arm, slightly decreased arm speed. So really, if we look at the big picture and we're gonna turn, go over to the um, questions and answers discussion in a second as a group. But I just wanna say uh, the outcomes after UCL surgery as Dr. Uh, Dugas and everybody was saying are good in general. And the uh, UCL reconstruction, uh, 70 to 80% of the pitchers return to previous levels as you pointed out. But those who do return uh, demonstrate good mechanics. The UCL repair, we've had excellent return to play uh, numbers. And uh, those who do return initially demonstrate good mechanics except for slightly lower arm speeds. I think that will go away uh, a few months later. So with that, Mark, I'm gonna um, stop sharing here and uh, turn it back over to the panel. I'll pan it back over to Mark. Uh, Mark, you're on mute, you're on mute. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, excellent talk. We're gonna move now to the question and answer session. Um, we've had a few questions that have come in. And so we just wanted to pitch uh, a question to each specific member of the panel and then anybody else can feel free to unmute and, uh, and chime in as well. Uh, our first question for the evening is for Dr. Andrews. Uh, and this, this says, what has been the biggest change that you have observed in the treatment of UCL injuries as they've become more recognized in the media and the orthopedic literature in recent decades? I think the thing that gets my attention is when we first started with Tommy John's procedure, the number one group having this procedure numbers wise was the professional group, uh, minor league and then major league. Uh, the initial series I did, we only had nine kids in, in uh, adolescent age. Uh, and since then, the thing that is so disturbing is now the number one group having this procedure is the youth group. And that just tells you the problem we've got out there in, in youth sports in general, particularly in youth baseball. Uh, Obviously, there have been a number of, of, of technical improvements in this procedure. Everybody's gotten better at doing it. Uh, there, there's now a, a number of doctors that do this procedure and do it as, as experts. Uh, if I had to say the one procedure that has changed everything and is still in the change is the internal brace that Jeff Dugas talked about. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, the other thing that I've noticed that's important in this young age group, the younger they are, the more pain they complain of as throwers and the less pathology you find in, in their actual workup. Whereas in the older age group, particularly in the major league players, they can go a long ways with a terrible looking ligament without surgery. So it's just the opposite. Uh, that's why in the younger age group, the internal brace and direct repair uh, is certainly something you need to look at because that procedure, that Tommy John's procedure wasn't, wasn't designed for young kids. That's been the major change though. 
it's been amazing to see in the literature in recent years, the drop in the average age. I think Kevin referred to that in his talk from, from Brandon Erickson's study in our college baseball study, our average age of all the kids, over 500 kids have had UCL surgery and collegiate baseball in the last three years. And the average age is 19. Um, so by far underclassmen. And uh, so Kevin, this next question is for you. Um, and this piggybacks off of that a little bit with dealing with a younger population undergoing surgery and therefore a younger population doing post-operative rehab. What's the biggest challenge that you've seen in getting patients to buy into the time it takes to appropriately recover from a UCL surgery, whether it be reconstruction or repair? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the time is very long. It's, it's where almost ACL patients are going to now. And so we have to keep them engaged. We have to keep them motivated. And I think, you know, four months uh, is a reasonable time to start throwing after a reconstruction. Um, I really do, because what we've tried to do with our throwing program is keep them engaged in a strengthening program as well. But also the throwing program has those plateaus built in. And obviously, as Dr. Andrews has always said through the years, if you have any problems at one particular phase, you stay at that phase where you back down. So if it's not a race, it's really a marathon. And uh, the real challenge, I, I think, is really getting them to buy into a slow throwing program. If you start them at four months and you're saying they're not going to go back till nine months or a year, that's a big window of time that they have to stay motivated. So I think being creative with your exercises, I think bringing legs into the equation, but also engaging them maybe into something else is, is beneficial, other sports and so forth. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next is for Mike Reinholtz, and this kind of piggybacks on that as well. Um, the question is, is the timing for the throwing program fairly inflexible, or is it possible to have a standard and an accelerated program depending on how well the patient is progressing? So that's for you, Dr. Wilk, feel free to jump in on that as well. Yeah, um, great question. I, I think I would almost flip it the opposite where we have a standard and a decelerated approach because I always want everybody to come back as fast and as safely as they can. So I wouldn't say that I would necessarily accelerate somebody sooner than that. But for us, we always, we play with a lot of variables. And one of the most important things that we probably do is we try to time it up based on the time of the year. So it really depends. A good example is maybe somebody has uh, surgery at the end of the season. So they have a Tommy John procedure in let's say October, right? Well, there's no real rush to get back at the 12, 13 month mark because well, it's October, right? So we may delay the start of that. We may have a deload period in the middle where they have a bit of a vacation. We may kind of ramp them back up over time. It really depends. So the first thing we do is we don't just blanket say you start at week X. Well, yes, of course, that's the earliest you can start, but then we try to time it based on what their schedule is going to look like. And then from there, I think we want everybody to follow that progression, but we will slow them down if there's some speed bumps along the way. For me, I think that happens a lot with people that can't control their intensity, that people maybe try to throw a little bit too hard. Maybe they're starting to get after it too hard in the gym, right? So they start to exacerbate maybe some forearm tightness and soreness, and they can't delineate, is that from the surgery or is that from a workout, whatever it may be. We may want to pump the brakes on them a little bit again. But for me, it's always with that concept we talked about in the presentation, starting with the end in mind to determine where we want to get to that endpoint at the end of the procedure. Perfect. Mark, to that point, uh, I've got a minor league baseball player. Uh, he's about 13 months post UCL reconstruction. And the other day, throwing in another facility, he clocked, he put it on his social media, 94, 95 miles an hour at 13 months. And there is no minor league baseball going on right now. <laughs> and so I, you know, as Mike commented, sometimes we have to hold them back and say, why are you doing this? And he said, it's not even a max effort yet. Yeah. which I found hard to believe because he usually <laughs> sits at 93. But the point of the story is if we're not monitoring that and he's not going to probably play till next year, let's slow down the process. Right. Let's, let's stop it. And the modus sleeve can give us that information. Let's stretch it out a little bit. Let's preoccupy him with something else and then re-engage him again. And, and I think that's the way to progress with a lot of these high school kids that really are highly motivated and, and they really have sincere interest in just doing well and returning back to play. I mean, that's really what it's about. They just want to do well. 
I had a patient who I did a UCL repair on a high school guy last year, and the mom sent me a video at just past four months of him throwing 95. And I about had a heart attack and there's nothing you can do about it when they're four months out from surgery. And the kid said he felt great and he wanted to make a showcase that was coming up on the calendar because then he could potentially get a scholarship offer for the next level. Dr. Andrews, would you mind just commenting on showcases in general and, and the current environment of, uh, of that in terms of a challenge in rehab from UCL surgery? Well, showcases in youth baseball are in the top five reasons for injury to the shoulder and elbow in, in, my, in my practice. I call them show out cases. And parents think they're so important. They're, they're not, usually they're not even in shape to go there and they put on a radar gun. They got all these coaches with radar guns watching them. They all want to match 90 miles per hour and they're getting hurt. So, you know, I, I, when I, the first thing parents ask me is we got a showcase coming up. And I almost want to tell them, if you want me to help take care of your son and get him through this, and you're going to take them to a showcase, you need to get another doctor. I mean, that's how, how uh, adamant I am about them. I think they're crazy. And I think we need to de-emphasize their importance. And they're nothing but troublemakers. And you know what? It's all about the mighty dollar. By the way, there's one other thing I wanted to ask Kevin and Mikey. What about monitoring your throwing program, your interval throwing program, with the radar gun to, to bring them along with certain velocity on different steps. I know some of our, of our friends are doing that. I think Neil Elitrosh is doing that on the West Coast. Do y'all know much about is that valuable or is it being done? What do you think about it? Think yeah, I mean, I'm a firm believer in it. That's why uh, we have them throw often at ASMI. We try to get the uh, video cameras on if we can't get the radar gun. But I tell them, just like I told that minor league player, there's only three ways that you can hurt your ligament right now. Hard throwing, weighted ball throwing, where you do runs and throws and things like that, and if you fall off a building. So don't do those three things, please. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> the radar uh, guns, I'm all in as far as recovery, but not trying to max it out. Mike? No, controlling them. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we've run into some trouble with radar guns. We actually got away from them, but in favor of the modus sleeve because it, well, it's, the modus sleeve is just better for every reason because it actually monitors the stress. The problem with the radar guns that we found sometimes is some people were taking it a little bit too specific. So when we have in our, in our protocol, for example, to throw at 50% effort, people were trying to do an equation to throw at 50% velocity. And we've known this has been published in studies that 50% effort produces more than 50% velocity, but that's factored in. We understand that. We, we appreciate that. And Dr. Fleissig did this many years ago in some of his really early research that showed the partial effort throwing wasn't a percentage of velocity. It was much, much higher. So I've seen people get in trouble by trying to say, well, I want you to be the radar gun. I want you to be 50% your velocity. That's actually much less. What we use it for, it's almost like a learning tool for the clinician that, that does it. We like to play catch with our players. I play catch with everybody still every day. We play catch with them. I want to see the ball. I want to feel the ball come into my mitt because I want to tell how much intensity he's putting on it. If you need a radar gun to look at that, you can say, hey, wow, this, that last throw at 90 feet that came in at 62 miles per hour and your other ones were all 55, calm it down a little bit. But I don't think there's an exact way to use a radar gun that we can use the exact numbers. I think if you're going to try to do that, you should go modus leave. It's actually cheaper than a radar gun. So yeah. you can just use the I, modus I just, leave. <laughs> I just want to add to that. Exactly. In our biomechanics lab, we've shown that velocity and stress in the elbow are not the same thing. So a radar gun is better than nothing. But um, like Mike said, uh, it, or, uh, the, the modus leave is the better way to go. You can measure how much stress in the elbow. If you do use a radar gun, a 50% effort throw is about 75% of your miles per hour. And, and a 80%, a 75% effort throw should be about 90% of your full effort velocity. So that, that's the ratio if you have to use radar gun, but the modus leaves a better way to go. Yeah, what I would say to that, let me just say one more thing, Mark. 
uh, in defense of the radar gun. What I would say is do both. That's what we do. But if you don't have a modus lead, which is not very expensive, by the way, as Mike mentioned, is you can do whatever they sit at or whatever their peak velocity, what they claim was, you can bring that down by percentages. And really the goal is to keep them at that 70, 80 percentile. Because what's been shown by several studies is once you get above that 80 percent perceived effort, that's when problems start to develop. Right. The study by Slenker and AJSM in 14 actually showed 60% effort equaled 76% force and 80 per 84% velocity. It's not even that correlates just to make it even more confusing. So it's, it's, it's hard. I, I, I think radar guns were fantastic before MODIS, but I, I just think there's an easier way to do it now. And last thing on that, Mark, I just want to say <laughs> that that was the whole intention of, of what Kevin designed in the interval throwing program. Basically, backing up their, their distance they could throw is incre increasing their effort. So that's the whole uh, inherent design of the interval throwing program. Very good. Excellent discussion on that one, guys. A um, couple more minutes and just a few more questions we'd like to get Hugh here. Um, this is one for Dr. Dugas. Uh, what are some potential pitfalls regarding UCL repair becoming more widespread and being performed more commonly in the community as opposed to some of the high volume specialty centers where it began? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Mark. Um, you know, I think that the danger is that not knowing what represents a, a tissue deficiency or what the, what the ins and outs, the, the, the pearls of doing the operation are. Obviously for any reconstruction or repair, the key is where you place the graft or the tunnels or the brace. And, and so if you're not astute at drilling those tunnels, whether it be for repair or reconstruction, you're not gonna have a graft in a good position. So if this is not an operation that is familiar to you, I would tell you, you can probably do more harm with the repair than you can with the reconstruction. It is a rigid construct. And if you put that thing in the wrong place, you will capture the elbow because that tape is not gonna give. So I would say that people that don't do a lot of, or at least a reasonable amount of these operations or aren't familiar with them, dabbling in the repair is not the thing to do. I, I would say they need to really understand reconstruction and have seen it and done a lot of it to do the repair because there's some nuances to doing it that you have to understand that I really think you can only get by doing reconstruction. And, and one of those nuances you discussed in your talk, would you say number one error, making it too tight? having it be too tight when they put the tape in? Yeah, I think that's the thing that we've cautioned against from the beginning. So fortunately, we haven't seen it. But I think that's the number one risk if you're not careful with it is putting it in too tight. That construct is so rigid that it's a problem if you put it in too tight. It's not going to give. So whereas, a, you know, we, we know that the reconstructions at time zero, they can give a little bit in a millimeter or two, and that's not going to change the long term outcome. That that repair is not going to give a millimeter or two. So I, I think you got to really understand where the tunnels go. It's more precise. It requires more precision to do the repair than the reconstruction, I would say. For sure. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. We're going to try to get to two more questions. This one's for Dr. Fleissig, uh, and it says here, um, with similar but slightly different biomechanics following UCL reconstruction versus repair, does that mean that it, some athletes could have a greater risk for failure with slight differences from their native biomechanics? So yeah, so the UC, after returning from UCL reconstruction, it did look like normal mechanics. We don't have these same people before and after. We just compared them to normal pitchers. So I don't think there's any concern for the pitcher who returned from UCL reconstruction one to two or three years later, I would assume he's back to his, his typical mechanics. If he's not, he's probably not back playing. The uh, UCL repair uh, with Dr. Dugas we very aggressively got them in the biomechanics lab as soon as possible. And although the arm speed was slower, I was very encouraged that they didn't have other compromises like a shorter stride or pushing the ball. So I think if the pitcher is back to normal and feeling 100%, you should analyze their mechanics in any case. Maybe you find a mechanical flaw that led to their injury in the first place. Uh, but I don't think having UCL repair or reconstruction is a is a death sentence for having bad mechanics. I think you could uh, come back and have good mechanics. Very good, okay. Um, final question, and we'll throw this one to Dr. Dugas as well. Um, would there be a role for ultrasound evaluation 
of the medial epicondyle, the ligament, and the sublime tubercle to influence internal bracing versus reconstruction planning preoperatively? So I think there can be, if you're really astute at doing ultrasound and you have a good ultrasonographer, obviously the issue with ultrasound is you got to have a person that's astute at doing it and interpreting it. And, and I can tell you that in my hands, I don't know how to turn that thing on and I certainly don't know how to interpret them. So I rely on people that are good at that to do it. Um, I think that the best part of, of ultrasound for me is the dynamic nature of it. I can get a dynamic test and that adds to the accuracy of diagnosis. I don't use that often. I still like the MRIs with intraarticular contrast um, as the best test. But remember, I think all of these tests are there to confirm what you think based on your history and your exam. You don't want to operate on the MRI or the ultrasound. You want to operate on the person and you can know the answer and the, and the MRI and the ultrasound should really confirm it, not, not be what you're hanging your hat on. Mark, do we want to stay on a few more minutes? We got a lot of questions. I don't know how everybody else feels about it. I'm fine with a few more minutes. Maybe no. a few more minutes, Mark. Go ahead and take one, Kevin. Pick one that you see. <laughs> wow. There's like 32 of them, man. Put, you, put, you, put Dr. you on the spot. Yeah, no problem. I, I can read them. Dr. <laughs> Andrews, is throwing greater than 80 miles per hour the biggest risk for factor for tearing a UCL or is it fatigue? The two, the two things that are the biggest factors are fatigue and velocity. The problem, Kevin, and we talked about it and we didn't really get into it, but the ligament is a developmental ligament. Baseball in general is a developmental sport. The arm gets bigger and thicker, the bone gets bigger, the muscles are bigger on the throwing side, and it, it ramps out at about age 26. At least that's my impression. The problem, I'm add, sorry. The problem is, is in a young kid, their, their ligament may redline at 75 miles per hour. You got another one with good genetics, a daddy played professional baseball. He red lines at 90, but yet we got all these kids trying to throw 90 and we don't really know how good their ligament is to begin with. It's not necessarily maybe bad mechanics, but it's the, the, the tensile properties of that ligament that we don't really know. I think uh, Glenn can tell you, we looked at, at some, but tell, can you, Tell us again what we found out when we tried to figure out what what the, the young kids' ligament tensile properties would uh, would be or to expect. You remember that right. study? Again? Yeah. So on that study, you're referring to uh, high school pitchers. If they threw more than 80 miles per hour, they were at higher risk than those who didn't. Maybe it was 85. Uh, but um, but as Dr. Andrews is saying, it's not, it's not really a question of whether fatigue is the biggest issue or high velocity, it's not one or the other, it's both. The, the full effort pitching, the pitching year round, and the poor mechanics, those lead to microscopic problems in your elbow. The fatigue is your body telling you you're starting to have some problems, and if you don't listen to it, all those things are gonna to lead to injury. So I think fatigue is the warning sign, but the full effort pitching and the year round and the poor mechanics are the factors that led to the warning signs. Yeah, I would, I, I would urge, urge the people out there that it's effort and not necessarily the miles per hour. It's when people are really efforting up is the problem. And that's what John Smoltz was trying to say in that Hall of Fame uh, speech. Yes, Dr. Andrews. The, the thing that uh, is, is so important that, that fits into all these risk factors we're talking about from my standpoint if you do long toss, I'm talking about 250, 300 feet max effort, or if you if you do a weighted ball program, then you're going to reach those fact those those peaks, those fatigue factors, and your tensile properties factor, and your velocity factor. You're going to reach them much quicker, and those two things are producing a ton of injuries out there. Uh, you can't imagine, and, you know, and, and their parents are buying into that because they say that because it's a way to get three or four miles per hour. Oh, yeah. The problem is if you get three or four miles per hour faster on that elbow in a young kid, 15 years old, are you surpassing the tensile properties of his ligament? Probably, maybe not, yeah. probably. And then they get hurt. That's why we've got all these youth problems going on in youth baseball. 
Hey, Mike, here's a question for you. This is, I think, a really good practical question. Mike, by the way, is asking this question. When do you begin passive range of motion and external rotation after a reconstruction and repair? And is, it, is there a difference between it uh, with a, uh, a repair versus a reconstruction? And then lastly, what generates more UCL strain? Is it isometric internal or external rotation? That's a, always a good question there. Yeah, I love our, that question by Mike. Go ahead. That was our past typos. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, we, we actually, Kevin and I have a story about that. But uh, for passive external rotation, I mean, we don't do a ton early on. We probably don't start getting too much into external rotation, even just gently until about eight weeks or so. I probably don't push back significantly until about 12 weeks or so to start to restore that range of motion before week 20 to or 16 to 20 to start getting them ready for some of those things. Just realize like you're going to be starting to do plyometrics and stuff about 12, 14 weeks. You got to have some passive range of motion before you do that. Um, and then Kevin, obviously jump in if, if you do that a little faster w with the repair, it's everything's just faster. So, you know, if you start throwing at, was it, you know, week, you know, eight or whatever, maybe Kevin, right. You start throwing at week eight, you have to start working into that external rotation, probably week five, six to start to get them ready. So, um, and then, um, I don't know, Kevin, anything different before we talk isometric? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit quicker than you, but I think, I think your point is well taken. I think you have to be careful, you know, pushing in the external rotation. And obviously that's the stress. You just wrote a paper on this uh, that everyone should be aware of in the Journal of Sports Health that showed with weighted ball throwing, you increase ER. And when you increase ER, Mike, what happens? You increase layback, you increase stress, you increase injury risk, but you probably also increase velocity. So it's a quadruple edge sword is that a thing yeah <laughs> it is now so. <laughs> what about isometric mike well so I, I so it was funny so isometrics we used to caution against doing external rotation isometrics you don't want to create an external rotation or like a, a, a varus torque of rest but there was a big paper that we wrote that we, we screwed it up and we put internal rotation. So for years, people were confused which one you didn't do internal, external rotation. So it's external rotation that we don't do early on. But to be honest with you, I kind of do. Do you still not do it, Kevin? I do. No, I, I do it. I just yeah. tell them just do it sub max, do it sub painfully. Right. It, it's isometric. So theoretically, there's not that much torque, but our bad, we made a typo. And you actually screwed that paper up, not me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's a question from, I'm sorry? Don't do it. You, you threw it over our head. Why do you not do it? What, what are you saying? So, so if, you, if you push too much into external rotation, you could argue even isometrically you're creating some varus torque. I'm speaking Dr. Fleissig terminology, so I don't, I don't want to jump in, but it's such a low level stress at, with an isometric. Yep. It's like 15, 20% MVIC. Uh, it's probably a moot point. Uh, yeah. what, what do you think? Hey, here, here's another Sorry. great question. This is by Adam, and uh, this is for the physicians. What about apophysitis in a growth uh, in adolescence? And well, how long do you recommend rest time? And what do you do with a medial epicondyle type injury like an avulsion? That's a great question. We certainly see enough of that stuff. Mark, you want to handle that? Go ahead. Sorry, I've got problems with uh, my screen. Mike Oliver's coming over to take a look. So, um, you know, I, I do it the way Dr. Andrews taught me. You know, if it's a displaced medial epicondyle, you fix it in a the thrower. They're, they're not going to throw very well if it's displaced. So, you know, you can probably tolerate a millimeter or, you know, something like that. But if, you, if it moves distally, if it's separated from the, epicond from, the, from the bone by four or five millimeters or it moves distally, in a thrower, you're potentially creating some problems later if they're going to continue to throw. In a non-thrower, I, I think it's a no-brainer. You don't have to fix many of them. Apophysitis, Dr. Andrews, we still, I mean, I would tend to rest those people six, eight weeks from throwing, maybe do some plyos and, and start them back in the throwing program. What's your, is that still your, your thought on that? Yeah, but sometimes it takes longer than that. It does. It whatever time, it, 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 and then you got to, you can't yo-yo. That's the problem. And parents would call you in a week. Can he start hitting off a tee? Can he play golf? Can he do this? Can he catch and roll the ball back? So they yo-yo, and you can't ever tell what they're doing. So it, it, you, it, in those cases, they continue to hurt for months. But the other problem, uh, Jeff, is it's not the displacement distally, but it, it the the vector force is pulling on that loose medial epicondyle will displace it posteriorly. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. 
because when you take an AP x-ray and it's displaced posteriorly, they don't recognize the displacement. They say it's not displaced and it right. could be off a half a centimeter, a little bit distantly, but mostly posterior. So those are really problematic. I don't really, if, 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 it, if it's got any displacement at all, I think it ought to be fixed. In a thrower, absolutely, I agree. What about, uh, what about- Another problem with that, Kevin. Yep. We can't prove it because we can't take people that have had a medial epicondylar displacement fixed with a screw and follow them longitudinally. We've never been able to do that. But what I'm seeing is I, I think it's true. I think that that ulnar collateral ligament, when that happens when they're 12, it's not just a bone problem. I think that they are set up and have micro injury to their ligament and they have a higher incidence of winding up needing a Tommy John's when they're 19, 20, 22, 23, 25 years old because of that injury. So it's not the end of, 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 of their problems when, they, when you put it back with a screw because I think that ligament has something happened to it at the same time. By the way, we've never been able to get a, a, a maybe maybe y'all could do that, Jeff, get a, a, a cadaver, a, a, a fresh amputation specimen from a young kid that has wide open growth plates and tell me where the ligament attaches. Okay. Never been done. You, hey, Mark, you, what, a, what about apocytis in these throwers? How long, they're asking about how long to rest them and when to start throwing again. What's your time frame? Yeah, typically, uh, you know, I think the hardest thing we've touched on this before with some of these young players, a lot of times we see that in our youngest and most vulnerable population. And so um, the biggest challenge, uh, really what Dr. Andrews talked about is trying to get to the parents, to the coaches and the, and the player to understand um, that the, the rest is going to be critical and it can't be overstated that, that, you know, you, you tell a patient, some of these players, you tell them two weeks and they go crazy and they say, I'm, I'm booked for two weeks. I don't have two weeks. Um, but I think at least six weeks of rest and then reevaluate. Um, if you've got clinical apophysitis in a young patient, young player with open Pisces, um, you know, the, the biggest challenge is going to be trying to convince them to, to hold, hold off on the calendar um, for at least six weeks before a clinical evaluation. It's a challenge. I think it's the most challenging patient population. One of the problems as a doctor is you don't see them too often. See them in six week intervals, because if you see them at two weeks and two weeks, they'll talk you into letting them do something you wouldn't ordinarily let them do because you feel, feel bad for them and they, the parents are there and they'll talk you into it. So stay off the phone with them and don't see them at about every six weeks. And, give them a and, and if they won't follow your advice, then let somebody else take care of them. <laughs> hey, a couple last questions here because we could go all night. The uh, questions are increasing as we go. Um, here's a question, Mike, maybe you and I can handle it and then throw it to the doctors. Um, uh, somebody asked the question, the person's name is anonymous, which I know that person. Uh, they're asking about uh, non-operative rehab. Is there a place for that in the UCL? And then the second part of the question will be for the physicians. What about PRP, stem cell, and orthobiologics? So, Mike, how long do you non-op these people before maybe you pull the plug or you know they're going to do well? How long is the process and what do you focus on? I mean, it certainly is going to depend on the timing of it. Again, if we're trying to, if we're trying to, to make sure this syncs up to get them back for next year's competitive season, we may shorten this, but usually it's about six weeks. It's usually about four to six weeks of no throw and then we ramp them back up. And as everybody knows, if, you, if you're down four to six weeks, it's going to take four to six weeks to ramp back up. So you're potentially looking at three months of a non-operative time frame to figure out if this thing worked or not. So a lot of times that doesn't work for people, especially at the professional level that might put them in the middle of that next season. So that may change a little bit, but um, that's usually what we would do in, in some people and the lower level injuries, sometimes, you know, that works, but for the higher grade injuries for me, I'm, we're just so, I think we're a little bit more pessimistic, Kevin, like, don't, don't you agree? And it's probably, uh, you know, probably easier. There's some people at the four week mark, you can still get like symptoms with valgus testing and a milking and, that, you know, it's very pessimistic if it's been four weeks without throwing and you're still symptomatic on an exam. Yeah, you know, that's what I use, Mike, is actually like a moving valgus occasionally to see also how they progress with their plyometrics 
if they have any pain, you know, with wall throws or plyometrics, end range stabilization, or moving valgus, they're not ready to throw. The, the only study that's ever shown these people do well is the Curl and Job uh, study. And it, it really, uh, Dr. Yoakum was one of the authors. It, it was four months before they went back. That was after a PRP. So that's the lead in. Uh, whoever wants to take uh, the orthobiologics first, maybe we can go right around the horn with Dr. Andrews Dugas and Rodermick. Yeah, we've been selectively using PRP with conservative treatment particularly for minor injuries in, in younger kids. And we were getting about a 60% success rate. Uh, what we don't know is the professional players that get PRP. We don't, we're trying to work on that study right now and y'all need to do the same thing. In your PRPs that, where you're doing conservative treatment in professional players, older players, how often is it successful? And the older, most of the players that come to see me got somebody that had, one of their buddies had a PRP injection for a partial tear, didn't work and they don't want to do it. So we need to, to show how many of those cases we actually are getting well with conservative treatment and with the PRP injection. Now stem cell situation, we still don't know a lot about that. We, we have people that ask us to do stem cell. I had one today that asked me you know, Tommy John's reconstruction, when I made the, his ligament graft with stem cell, they brought it up. Uh, he was willing to, to pay for it, uh, and I did it. But I have no idea whether it's going to help or not. No way to know that at this point. It won't hurt. And if it helps him, then it's probably worth doing. Anyone yeah. else? I agree. I get. I you know. I would say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Dr. Andrews just articulated my exact thoughts on that. I don't think we've been able to reproduce Podesta's data um, with Lou. You know, I, I think partial is a big word. You know, partial represents everything from a little bit to a lot. And I, and I think until we can really drill down on what partial is, par, how partial is partial, we're going to have a hard time knowing how successful we can be with these things. What's your best guess about judging the partial, Dr. Dugas? Is it MRI or clinical I exam? Or both? MRI and ultrasound and, you know, I mean, uh, the, the 3T MRIs with contrast, I mean, all those things. But I, I agree completely with Dr. Andrews. I've done exactly the same thing with the stem cell thing. I don't know if it works. I've been asked to bathe the thing in that. I, we just don't know. And um, there's a lot to do. I mean, as, as always, there's a lot to do. we got a lot of work to do to figure some of these things out. You know, Jeff, everybody talks about like, he's got a 20% tear of his ligament. He's got a 30% tear. There's no way in the world, and as many as I've seen, I can't give you a percentage. That's right. But, you know, you got to say, where is it torn? Is it distal? Which is a lot of times not as good a prognosis. Is it mid-substance? Is it pro proximal? Uh, and what I use uh, is, is the location of the tear. Or is it all up and down the damn ligament? Mm -hmm. And then I say low grade, partial tears, I say low grade, medium grade, and high grade. And that's the yeah. best I can do. I can't even do any better than that when I'm in there looking at it, split it. <laughs> you what I agree with you completely. Control. And that's just like what Dr. Dugie said about the ultrasound question is we can have excellent technicians and great advanced imaging studies, but you can't replace visualizing it surgically in terms of prognosticating with patients and their families. And I agree with Dr. Andrews and Dr. Dugas. Again, the apple doesn't fall far. I've spent a lot of time in this clinic with Dr. Dugas and repeat basically verbatim his talk with patients about how the, the hard science just isn't there yet. And, and I like to use, if using orthobiologics at all as a complement to rest. And I try to talk with patients and their families that this is totally different from giving one of our older patients a knee cortisone injection and send them back out on the golf course the next day that this is a totally different science and it has to be complemented by rest as well. You know, when we use PRP in these young kids, we use it like you just hinted, we use it to complement rest, but we, we use it so the parents have to pay for it and they feel like you've done something, maybe they'll listen to you and you yeah. tell them they can't throw for six weeks because the PRP has been put in there. Now the PRP may have nothing to do with it, but at least if they, 
if you do that, they may listen to you and give them <laughs> proper active rest and rehab. Yeah, it's a little easier. I think to it's important to point out, though, that the people that are doing this, I mean, Josh Hackle down in Pensacola, the guys here at our place, these guys are among the best of the best with needle, you know, using an ultrasound. And, you know, they've got a lot of experience. You know, Josh is certainly, they, they teach these things. So I, I do think that we probably benefit from their expertise when it comes to that stuff, too. Hey, uh, a lot of questions came in about the speed that we move people and so forth. Let me just make a generic statement. I have one question for Dr. Fleissig, and we'll wrap this up. When in doubt, go slow. Seriously. I mean, you have no no rush unless, you know, it's a pro who's at the end of their career and they can make a, a uh, concern uh, decision. But when you're dealing with high school kids and youth baseball players, you're better off sending a slower message right off the bat. Hey, Dr. Fleissig, if somebody wants to be sent to the lab to do biomechanics, when should when is the right time after UCL surgery to go to the lab for mechanic uh, mechanical analysis? Good, good question. This thing is so accurate. We we want to see them at their 100% normal mechanics. What that means is, I tell them don't come here till you're at 100%. Whatever that means to them. Um, so essentially, you need to be back to as far as you could progress. If, if you got to a part and you're stuck, you can't get any better, come on in. But if you're still getting better as far as your uh, rehab, uh, wait till you're done with rehab, wait till you're ready to return to sport. Hey, Glenn, Kevin, are you are, Go ahead, Dr. Andrews. That, uh, as we close, people often, players always, uh, often ask me, what advice do I give them with their procedure? whatever procedure, but it's basically the Tommy John's procedure. And I say three words, don't rush it and leave them with that. Leave them with that thought. You know, and you were emphasizing that too. Hey, Glenn, are you all right if the questions we didn't get to, can they send those questions to ASMI and yeah. we can discern yeah, those out, distribute so those it, out? And again, my email, you can find on the ASMI website or it's glennf at asmi.org. Sure. Send all mine to Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna send it, Kevin. And uh, and thank you for thank you for taking over. I had a glitch in my Zoom and I couldn't see the questions. So thank you for taking over and and going through some of those. Uh, we could go all night on this topic, and this has been a lot of fun, guys. So thank you to this all star panel for some great discussions tonight. I'm gonna go through our housekeeping items just one more time to close um, for everybody in terms of their CME and C, uh, CEU certificates. Um, so thank you again to all our speakers. And this will be available again on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, so for those watching on YouTube and Facebook, please send an email to ASMI's course coordinator, Caroline May at carolinem at asmi.org with your name and credentials to receive your certificate for tonight's session. CME and CEU certificates will be emailed in approximately two weeks. Participants other than MDs and ATCs will receive a certificate of attendance that can be presented to your fresh, uh, professions board to receive credit. And please be sure to click on the link to SurveyMonkey that was in your reminder email earlier this afternoon. We appreciate your feedback on tonight's session as well as any suggestions you might have to help make us make future masterclass sessions better. Thank you again, everybody. Hey, Mark, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Don't forget everyone who's on this call about ASMI's baseball course in January. Uh, we'll be bigger and better in January. Hopefully we'll be able to do it live, but. There may be another component to it. So stay tuned. Go to ASMI.org for more information. And we're looking forward to a great baseball season, a great baseball course. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you guys. Have a great one.